when we want to go on the spiritual path and explore experiences and levels of consciousness higher than the physical level at which we are now, we need a spiritual guide. It is not possible to have those experiences and that exploration without a spiritual guide because the mind does not help us to have those experiences. The human mind has the tendency by habit developed not only over years but over centuries and several lifetimes of drawing the attention out from within to external stimuli of experience. This habit of the mind to take the attention outside has become so strong that whatever we might do, the mind's tendency to take us out persists. Therefore, the mind is not a good guide for us in our spiritual efforts. If we do not like to have another human being as a spiritual guide, we can have recourse to some inner guides, some inner voices, inner visions. But if you actually analyze those inner voices and visions and images that come, you will find they are created by the mind. Therefore, to listen to an inner voice without being sure what inner voice it is, is to listen to the human mind. And people get into the wrong track by listening to the human mind. Some people say we need not bother about the inner voice, nor do we have to look for a spiritual master. We have enough evidence of God's presence and existence in nature. Why not go to the plants and the trees and the birds and the beasts? They all sing in praise of the Lord. Why not take a spiritual lesson from the birds, the bees, the animals, the plants? When you go to these animals and plants and bees and birds, you find that they do not speak to us in a language that we can understand. On the other hand, if we attribute to them certain language or meanings of what they are saying, it is again our human mind. Sometimes people think that good books are good enough as a spiritual guide. After all, these great masters, founders of religion, they came and they have left sufficient record in writing for us to be a guide. Why not then rely upon these books? And the books can guide us and show us the way. Here again, we find that when we read the books, they mean one thing today and another thing tomorrow. The book is the same, the words are the same. How can the meaning of the book change over time? The reason for this change of meaning of the words in a book is that our mind is reading it and mind is interpreting it. Therefore, one interpretation of the mind may not be the same as another interpretation of the mind. So when we read books written down in cold language, unrelated to our current contemporary situation, we again run into the difficulty of being caught up in the snare of our own mind. Some people wait for inspiration and intuition to teach them. Unless we are familiar with our own self within, it is very difficult to judge when the intuitive message will come. In any case, we have not trained our intuitive self to trigger off a message of knowledge. Therefore, we wait indefinitely and we may not get the message at all. Similarly, inspirational messages that come to us are generally created by the mind. So what do we do then? We want to have spiritual guidance because our attention is flowing outside. We do not know how to look inside. We do not want to have a man, another human being as a teacher, because he is like us. How can he teach us? And yet the birds, the beasts, the idea, they do not teach us. Perhaps angels and gods, and goddesses might be able to teach. We haven't seen them. They don't speak to us. When they speak to us in a seance or in a dream, it's our mind speaking to us. 
So again and again we find the same difficulty that whatever spiritual guide we try to choose, it turns out to be our own mind. And the mind then deludes us, takes us off the correct path and we never get spiritual life. How do we overcome this problem? The only alternative left is to choose another human being as our guide. But why should one human being choose another? Especially when people are talking of equality of rights and democracy and that human rights conventions have been set up. All human beings are equal. How can one human being claim to be better or higher or be able to guide the destiny of other human beings? Why should we in the modern age accept the mastership of one human being over another? The truth is that as a human being, the person we select as a guide or the one who becomes our master is just like us. There is no difference. He is as human as we are. There is only one difference. I have sometimes given this example that if there were a large number of television sets placed in this room, but none of them had a connection with a power source, they were not connected to a battery or to the electric power source, we would not be able to see the news of the world. But if one of them has a connection, with the power source, then on that television set, we can see the news of the world and be in touch with things outside. Similarly, when we talk of an enlightened one, a person who is a master, although he is just like the others, he is human like others, but he has established in his, con in his consciousness a connection with the powers that matter, that give him secret to all the higher regions of existence and experience. Therefore, the man with a connection is the master. And if you find such a man who has a connection with him, in spite of his otherwise complete humanism and humanity like us, he is completely different because through him we can have contact directly with the higher regions and higher worlds. How do we know which human being has got a connection with the higher worlds? Especially in an age when a large number of human beings are coming forth and claiming that they are the master. When we are getting a large number of fake masters, how do we find out who is the real master? I have been drawing your attention to some obvious ways to check the real master. I will repeat those criteria again that when you have more than one master before you and you have the problem of choosing who is the real master and who is the fake master? Please apply your mind on the following five point checklist. The first point is that if the master is real, he will have got his connection established at the highest level of consciousness that is with God himself. Therefore, he will be merged in the consciousness of the creator of this universe. Therefore, he will love all the people of this universe. He will not love a few people and disclaim the others. A perfect master does not come for some people. He comes for all. He is open to all. He does not discriminate on the basis of sex, religion, caste, creeds, nationality, citizenship or any other basis. For him, all people are the same. And therefore, you can judge that if there is a master for a particular group only. He could not be a perfect master. But if there is a master giving a message for humanity, this would be satisfying the first criteria. The second point on the checklist would be that if he is indeed a perfect master who has raised his consciousness and got a connection with God consciousness, then he will treat all the creation as his own and therefore he will love them. You will find in such a perfect master an overflow of love. You will find that in his presence everybody gets affected by that love and they respond to it because he is overflowing with love for everybody, not for any particular person. He has no hatred for anybody. Such a perfect master will love anybody from any country, any community, any color, any caste. He will love those who love him. He will love those who don't love him. He will love those who hate him. 
Therefore, he will be always in a personification of love. The third checkpoint you can apply is that if he is a perfect master, he has established his connection with God, the Creator, then he will not come here to break the creation that he himself has created. He will not come here to destroy what he has himself created. He will come to establish the will of the Creator in what he has created. Therefore, he will not perform such public miracles as destroy the properties of nature and the laws of nature. He will not be a street magician to show his magic to draw crowds and to say, I have come as a master to give you enlightenment. But he will perform private miracles to encourage faith and trust in our hearts. And those private miracles will be such that we will think it's a miraculous happening, but when we will share that happening with somebody else, with another friend, the friend will say, oh, that was not a magic or a miracle. It was only a sheer coincidence or just an accident. So most of the private miracles will be explained away as accidents or coincidences. The fourth checkpoint will be that since he has become one with the mass, with the ultimate truth and ultimate God who lives within us, and this body being the kingdom of that God, he will prescribe meditation and systems of going to God within ourselves. He will not draw us to any rituals, ceremonies, exercises and other activities outside. He will keep on pushing our attention within ourselves and keep on saying, go within, go within. The truth is within you. God himself is within you. Your own reality is within you. Whatever you have to find, please find within yourself. That will be his message at all times. And finally, the fifth checkpoint you could apply would be that being a perfect master, he would be one with everybody. He will not be separated from people. He will regard that he is in everybody. Therefore, he will not have to say he is a master. He will never say he is a master. In his humility, he will never let you know he is a master and his actions and his life will be such that you will never get a direct affirmation from him that he is a master. He will say he is no master, he is not even a good disciple. Or he will say he is a servant of the masters. Such humility these masters show us. Therefore, if you apply these five point checklists, even if you had 10 of these masters before you, you would find that after checking this, only one would be left within your view. So it is quite possible to find out who is that human being who has established this spiritual connection and can serve as our spiritual guide. What does this spiritual guide do? This spiritual guide not only teaches us by words, by lectures, by discourses, what the truth is, which indeed any books could have done. But he guides us with, from within ourselves. If the guidance of a spiritual master was confined to his lectures and speeches and discourses, our minds would interpret those speeches and discourses the same way as the mind interprets the books. He would be no different than the books. Therefore, he does not guide by only giving lectures and discourses, he guides by sitting inside us. Such a perfect master takes responsibility for our inward growth and our ascent to higher realms of consciousness by initiating us. What is initiation? Initiation is the process by which the master establishes himself in a real form inside our consciousness behind the eyes at the third eye center. So that when we withdraw our attention and go behind the eyes, we see him present there. And we can talk to him, we can walk with him, we can ask him questions and get answers. He can be a permanent companion, dispelling for all time the loneliness to which we have passed. Therefore, the initiation by a perfect living master is much more than merely learning a mantra or learning a, a mechanical system of meditation or learning some words which can be found in the books. He gives personal guidance by establishing himself personally within the consciousness of his disciples. And not only that, he takes us from that point onwards throughout the spiritual journey of the total consciousness. In fact, these perfect masters, when they guide their disciples, they tell them, look, 
we are going to proceed on a long journey. It's a beautiful journey. There are so many stages on the way. We will pass through the physical, the astral, the causal stages. We will fly to the pure spiritual regions. We will see what we are as souls. We will see light unknown of to the physical world here at all. We will ultimately go and reside in the house mm -hmm. of our own Lord, the home of our Father, which has been our own home, but we have forgotten. He gives this beautiful picture of a spiritual journey and he says, we will go together. He does not say, I am sending you there or you can go there with my guidance. He says, we will go there together. For indeed, the master and the disciple undertake this journey together. The master only puts one condition. He says, I will take you from the railroad station on the entire journey up to the railroad station. You come on your own. You reach there. I will reach there. I will do all the bookings. I will do the reservations. I will arrange the accommodations. I will arrange food on the way. I will make all the arrangements for the trip. And here are the guidebooks. Here is the time schedule. Then we can leave. You read these and come to the railroad station and we will leave from there. Our tragedy is that we do not reach the railroad station. And he keeps waiting for us there. The railroad station for the spiritual journey is the third eye center behind the eyes here. When we withdraw our attention and take it to the third eye center behind the eyes here, we find our master there waiting with all the arrangements made for our spiritual journey. But we, instead of going to the railroad station, start reading all the books about the journey. We read everything about the journey. We read it over and over again. We read all the time schedules. We see all the possible trains and flights that are possible, every means of locomotion. We read those books again and again, and ultimately we get into a habit. We think that reading of the books is taking of the journey. That is our plight today, that we are reading the books which contain descriptions of those journeys, which gives us instructions about those journeys. It gives us the obstacles that we have to meet in the journey. It tells us how to meet those obstacles. Instead of starting the journey, and going through that experience, we are, on the other hand, merely reading these books and getting more and more information without starting the journey at all. We cannot get the spiritual journey undertaken merely by reading about it. It is just like a person who feels hungry and he finds a good recipe book, a cookbook, and he keeps on reading nice recipes. His hunger will not disappear. But we read, keep on reading. We say the reading is going to give us the result. Reading will not give us the result, will not satisfy our appetite, will not satisfy our hunger. It is acting upon what we are read and acting upon it practically that will satisfy our hunger and make this journey start. Therefore, the living masters keep on telling us, keep on egging us to move on to the railroad station from where the journey will be taken jointly by the master and by the disciple. The masters, in fact, initiate us at the railroad station. When we are initiated, they are already there and they connect our inner sound, our inner attention to the sound current or the real railroad track with it. The sound current is a continuous railroad track that starts from behind the eyes and goes right up to the highest level of consciousness. Therefore, when our attention is connected to that track, we can go to the highest levels with the help of the, the perfect master who also travels with us. Therefore, when we talk of a spiritual guide, we are really referring to a perfect physical, physical form of a perfect master who gives us this assurance and takes us personally through all these regions. And not one who merely gives instructions or promises that something will happen in the future. Sometimes a doubt uh, creeps in. What will happen if we suddenly die? We have not done enough work to reach the railroad station. The master says he has initiated us. We may just die and our life may finish. What will happen? The experience of those disciples who have been initiated by perfect masters and who can speak to the others at the time of death has always been that at the time of death, the perfect master appears. Irrespective of whether the person has done his homework or not, whether he has done the meditation or not, whether he has prepared himself to take the journey or not, at the time of death, the same perfect master appears. 
and takes charge of the disciple and helps in the preparation of his next life when he again helps him to meditate and reach the railroad station for the spiritual journey. Therefore, there is an assurance. People are afraid of death. Whether they say it or not, people are afraid of death. But once two things happen. One, the assurance that the perfect master will come at the time of death. And second, the ability to die by living. If you can experience these two, the fear of death disappears altogether. Therefore, it is a very pragmatic cash transaction we are having with a perfect master and not a transaction that is in the future, which we will get in the next life or a future life. Uh, getting a perfect master is therefore a very great event in the life of itself. To be initiated by a perfect master is the greatest thing that can happen to a human being anywhere in the cosmos, in any life. Therefore, how can a human being be initiated? First, he has to find the perfect master. But we cannot find such a spiritual guide because these guides are acting so human, so much like us, that we cannot see any special sign. We cannot look around and find where the uh, physical form of the perfect master. That is why it is said that instead of our finding the perfect master, we should allow ourselves to be found by the perfect master. We should be in a state of readiness to be found. That means we should be in a state of seeking. We should seek and then he will find us. We should knock and he will open the door. In this context, I might mention that if we had the power and ability to find perfect masters, then perhaps we would not need the perfect masters. If we had those eyes open to see who is a perfect master, we don't need a perfect master. I gave an example of a room full of a lot of blind people. And those blind people know there is only one door outside, but which is flush with the wall, they can't find the door. They grope in that room, utterly blind. Then rumor goes around that one of the persons with eyes has come into the room. He knows where the door is, so he can lead the others out of the door. So all of them say, we are going to find that man with the eyes. And the blind people run around all over, looking for, searching for the man with eyes. What is the man with eyes doing? He's watching all this show because his eyes are open. The others blindly searching for him think they are searching. How can they search for him when they have no eyes? When they cannot see? But they still believe that they are searching for the man with the eyes. When the man whose eyes are open, he looks at these people and has compassion for those who have gone round and round so many times and they cannot find him and cannot find the door. He steps forward and comes in the way of one of these disciples going round and round. That blind man catches hold of this man with eyes and says, I have found you. I knew one day I will find you. He still believes that he has found the one with open eyes. It is always the other side that the man with open eyes could see the whole show. If he had decided not to be found, he would never have been found. When he decided to have compassion and love for that man, he saw that he was found. These perfect masters who have their eyes open to the higher regions of consciousness, higher levels of consciousness, they act in the same way. They appear before us and guide us when we are ready to, to be found. Therefore, the method to find a perfect master of the type which I have mentioned is to prepare for being found by the master. How does one prepare to be found? One prepares by having an intense longing and a seeking for the Lord. When one wants to go within to see the Lord, the Lord has compassion on his creation and sends his beloved sons in the form of perfect masters in physical form in this universe. And they then appear and guide and take those disciples back to the home of the Father. Therefore, a spiritual guide is a must because we don't want to be misled by our minds. We cannot find him, but he can find us if we prepare ourselves. And once we find him, he does not leave us alone. He takes us on the spiritual journey in his own company. And he says, I will keep this company right till the end till we reach the father's home. We are not left alone at any time. Thank you very much. Thank you. I shall be very glad to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the spiritual act? Yes, I do. To get his guidance, you have to see him in his physical form. 
he has come again and again as he said he would yes yes you will if you have once seen a perfect master you are bound to be initiated by some method at some time is the contact then with the master to begin with is on a physical force you hear let's say because we are looking out on the physical world with our eyes open therefore the lord appears in the physical world where we are looking if we had looked inside he might have arranged for us to meet him there but we are searching outside all the time even what is inside we search outside so he has no option but to come outside and then tell us now go within so the <coughs> first contact is with the physical form outside so then i get to see outside contact that outside contact continues within inside once you make outside contact with the perfect master he reestablishes you inside by his method by telling you where he is and then you have a contact with him inside and that is a permanent one yes they will see a master they will be initiated by a master in person at some stage in the future a master initiates you within but then he also makes himself his presence felt so that you can love him in the physical form that is the only form in which we can love anyone therefore he appears in this form so we can love him and if we have been initiated by a master without our knowing or at a distance sooner or later we will also be initiated by a master in physical form so this continues lifetime after lifetime but once initiated by a master even if you are unaware of it even if there has been no external knowledge of that initiation we will be initiated by a master with whom we will have a physical contact we will hold his hand and he will love us and show that he is in fact made of love yes if there are two or three or four perfect masters living at the same time in different places what is the difference between them there is no difference except that each master has his own list of marked sheep whom he takes and initiates a master comes with a specific responsibility on behalf of the lord and takes away his marked sheep of course he puts on the path many others that is why they say many are called but few are chosen the chosen ones are taken by that master directly to the home of the father in their lifetimes the others are prepared so they can be taken by another master in due course who chooses them but there is no difference if there are perfect living masters or a five of them they are all the same yes the more intense your longing to reach the goal the more time you give to the master the more you understand the subject the more meditation you do the less the chances of your postponing your visit and the more likely you will go in the same life plan So the main thing is that you will experience great love if you are going away the same life. Yes. There's there's going to be a contradiction. You said that you can only love in a physical form. Yet that form or that existence which is beyond the Akashic record, like at the spiritual level, is love. He is love. How do you distinguish between the two? They only love in a physical. that is love if we are also beyond physical form what i said is that when we are in physical form we can love only that which is in physical form we cannot be in physical form and say we are loving something beyond the akashic record that we cannot do in other words if we are ourselves pure soul we are of course love once we are above the physical plane ourselves then we are love but when we are in the physical bodies here we cannot express and have the experience of love except for another physical form therefore the lord when appears in physical form to us only when we are in the physical form there is no contradiction yes no all the higher levels he will stay with you in your spiritual journey through all the higher levels you will not be taking the journey alone you will be in the company of the spiritual master no he would not incarnate you find a new master what i meant was the inner journey 
in a spiritual journey from the third eye center up to our father's home or the or the stage of absolute or ultimate consciousness or total consciousness in there in that spiritual journey he will be with us all the time but of course uh, the physical form of the master is like us it is following the laws of nature about the bodies they will die and finish and therefore we will also finish in our physical body the master physical body will also finish and the relationship of the real master is within us so when we talk of spiritual journey we talk of the journey from the point behind the eyes to the highest regions of consciousness and there the spiritual form of the master is with us all the time in the physical form of course we keep on coming to a new master who must initiate us because we have been called by the previous one all masters are one that way yes well we will find that we were in fact love and truth and beauty and joy that was our real nature and we will live in that and rejoice in that forever we will not have to go through the sufferings of birth and rebirth and karma and all the problems we are having here yes when the master comes by birth then he does not suffer any of this suffering he is in total consciousness right from the beginning well this was the last of the series yes is there any difference between being initiated by the master representative and being initiated by the master himself the master is given his representative the representatives cannot initiate no representative can initiate only the master alone himself personally can initiate and the representatives are there not for initiating but for processing the application for initiation for doing this secretarial work for keeping the record and conveying the instructions of the master to the disciples the initiation takes place only at the third eye center by the master personally by no one else so it's the master that does initiation only the master if there's anybody else doing initiation it is of no use so the master have to be there in the physical presence of the initiation not necessary master can be anywhere he can initiate anyone at any time anywhere because he is not operating at the physical level at all initiation is not at the physical level there is no physical level initiation at all by a perfect master initiation by a perfect master is always at the third eye center behind the eyes in fact whether you are initiated or not you can only know after you reach there if you are told you have been initiated by a perfect master even in his presence you do not know if you have been initiated you have to reach the third eye center and then see if you are initiated Any session does not come below that. Yes, we never left it. We only left the awareness of it. We are not left our home. We are regaining only the awareness of the experience within the home. We never left. It. If we had left it, we would never go back. It is only the illusion in awareness that we have left it, and we remove that illusion, and we are back there. When we are back there, we won't feel that we have come back. we will feel we were always there when you reach the highest level of consciousness you do not get the experience you have come back somewhere you get the experience you were always there how did you miss it what happened to your awareness then you realize you had a dream out there a dream of lord creation and within the dream another dream of lord creation and so on just like here if we go to sleep in our bedroom and we have a dream and go and see some place outside if we visit in a dream rochester we haven't left our bedroom we are still here but in the dream we have gone there then we wake up from the dream it does not mean we have come back here it only means we come to know we had not gone anywhere we were all the time here but we were sleeping we were <coughs> unaware of our true state that is what happens well this was the last of the series of lectures organized by isha on this visit of mine i am very grateful to all of you who made it possible for me to come and meet you and visit these four cities and professor muller worked very hard to coordinate and the various uh, organizers at the four cities in milwaukee chicago rochester and the twin cities made very good arrangements for my stay for my transportation and especially for my food which i was served several times in the day so i am very grateful to all of you and i hope that i will be able to make a similar trip to this this area sometime in 1983 and i thank you once again for all the affection that 
you have shown me and which has been overwhelming. And I hope I'll carry these memories with me when I go back to India. Thank you.